Hello everyone, and today I'm pleased to present to you a record-breaking and potentially very exciting new 50mm lens, the Miticon Speedmaster 50mm f0.95. Now you might have heard of this lens before in a version available for mirrorless cameras, well now they've totally redesigned it so that it can fit on digital SLR cameras, and this one comes in Canon EF mount, offering a full frame image circle. And that's what's record breaking. In the world of digital SLR cameras, this is the brightest aperture lens ever put to market. The old Canon EF 50mm f1.0 L lens has worn that crown for the past 30 years, and now finally it's been beaten, and by something far more affordable. The old Canon lens will cost you at least about £4,000 wherever you can find it second hand, whereas this Miticon option is set to only cost US$800, or about £700, so it could be very good value for money, considering the kind of images it can get you, which are stunning as you can see here. The narrow depth of field at f0.95 is almost otherworldly, and combined with a classic 50mm focal length, you're left with a potentially very useful piece of kit. Let's do a quick image comparison, here it is against the Canon EF 50mm f1.4, each at their brightest apertures. First thing you'll notice is that the Miticon lens's light transmission does not actually seem to be much brighter than the Canon lens, the shutter speed is only a little bit faster, so that's a bit of a shame. But what is definitely not a shame is the huge difference in bokeh. The Miticon lens's backgrounds are clearly over twice as out of focus, and they look beautifully soft in comparison to the Canon lens, that is a big beautiful difference that a lot of people are really wanting to pay for. If you stop the Miticon lens down to f1.4, here's the result. As you can see, its aperture blades give it a little sharp outlining there. If you get this Miticon lens though, you will be sacrificing autofocus, it is manual focus only and manual aperture, which can be a little challenging, especially on a lens like this. I'd like to thank Miticon for sending me a sample copy of this lens for testing, although as usual, this is a totally independent review. Let's start by looking at its build quality. I've become familiar with the version of this lens for mirrorless cameras, which is not too enormous, but this digital SLR version is huge, weighing in at 1.5kg or 3 and a quarter pounds. Its weight is nicely balanced though, not being too front heavy. As you can guess, its body is made entirely of metal, and the brushed black paint finish is gorgeous. It really does look very imposing on your camera, very impressive, just look at all that glass, and not only at the front, but at the back. The rear glass element is so huge that they had to design a special mount to protect it from your camera's electronic contacts, that mount does not have weather sealing. The focus ring is metallic and extremely smooth, well damped and precise in use, it's precise enough for manual focusing at f0.95, without any real problems, which is exactly what we need here. Some good news is that, as you change focus, you won't see any focus breathing, so that could be helpful to video makers. Above the focus ring is the aperture ring, which turns very smoothly and rather heavily, I always prefer an aperture ring with clicks, but at least it turns heavily enough not to get accidentally turned around. It comes with a somewhat shallow hood, although it is at least flocked on the inside, and its filter thread size is quite a large 82mm, and that's it really, it's a physically impressive lens, but a simple one, it's actually quite enjoyable to handle, if you can handle its weight. Now let's see about image quality. Anyone who watched my review of the old Canon 50mm f1.0 lens will remember that it was very soft, unfortunately, and that was with me testing it only on a 30 megapixel camera, well, I'm going to start by challenging this lens with my Sony a7R2, with its 42 megapixel full frame sensor. In the middle of the image, at f0.95, we see a few things going on. Contrast is a bit low, the colours have a bit of a green tint to them, and there's purple fringing on contrasting edges. However, what's undeniable is that there's a surprising amount of resolution there. For example, if we move up the image just a little bit, we see quite a lot of detail in the middle, and that's important for portrait photographers. 
let's look over in the corners. Uh-oh. That's all I'm going to say at this point about the corners. Let's top down to f1.4. Now, the corners see a bit more brightness, but no other improvements. Over in the middle, sharpness and contrast are nicely improved, though. Let's top down to f2 for strikingly sharp image quality in the middle. The corners only see a small improvement in brightness and contrast, though. At f2.8, an image is taking shape there now, although even stopping down to f5.6 doesn't bring any more improvements. f8 is slightly sharp though, and f11 is just about usable, although the chromatic aberration is rather hefty. f16 is slightly better again in the corners too, despite the fact that diffraction should be kicking in at this point. Well, overall, the results are pretty clear. The designer's main priority for this lens was clearly centre sharpness, and in that respect, they delivered fairly well, even straight from f0.95. Although at that widest aperture, you'll still need to do a bit of tweaking in editing. The corner image quality is very poor. The lens is clearly designed with portrait and subject photography in mind, although with parameters like these, what did you expect? Still, it is miles sharper than that expensive Canon lens I tested. Well, that sharp centre image quality might be good news for APS-C camera owners. Let's see how it performs on a 24 megapixel Sony A5100 now. In the middle of the picture, at f0.95, the lens is clearly being pushed to its absolute limits, although some detail is being captured. Like before, the main problems centre around strongly contrasting edges. The corner image quality is very soft, again, with a lot of colour fringing, although it's not quite as bad as on full frame. Stop down to f1.4, and we begin to see a lot more clarity there, and the middle of the image is very sharp, albeit with a lot of purple fringing remaining. However, stop down to f2 for an excellent image quality in the middle. The corners are still rather weak though, f2.8 is better there, f4 quite sharp, although the colour fringing is really revealing itself now. The image quality stays this sharp down to f11. So, on APS-C, we get a little more corner sharpness, at the cost of accentuated colour fringing. For simple portrait work though, the lens is still just about usable. Ok, let's move on and look at distortion and vignetting on a full frame camera. The lens projects surprisingly little distortion, which is nice. Vignetting, unsurprisingly, is very strong at f0.95. It's about the same at f1.4, although as you stop down to f2 or darker, it begins to get pushed into the corners. However, even at f8, a little darkness remains in the very edges. Next, close-up image quality. The lens can only focus down to 65cm, further than average for a 50mm optic. Like the version for mirrorless cameras, the close-up image quality is very bad indeed, unfortunately, as you can see here. f1.4 is only a slight improvement, although from f2, the close-up image quality is quite nice, and f2.8 is sharp, so if you're shooting close-up, stop down. Next, work against bright lights. More problems here, we see plenty of flaring and glaring, although to be fair, it's mostly only when bright lights are actually in your picture. I didn't bother with a coma smearing test, as the lens's corners are a bit too soft for that, so let's move on and look at bokeh. In my test pictures, as you can see, I always found the lens's bokeh to be very smooth and pleasant at f0.95. I was really pleased with those images, although the bokeh is not without its foibles. The protective edge of the lens mounts that we saw earlier does interrupt the bokeh ball circles a little, and obviously, there's the expected cat's eye shape to them as you begin to look in the corners. Also, bokeh at f1.4 doesn't have a very pleasant shape, due to the shape of the iris blade. However, stop down further to f2, and they start to look a lot better. Still, those are foibles that you don't really notice very often in your pictures, especially if you're shooting at f0.95, and I still prefer the bokeh of this digital SLR version of the lens to the mirrorless version, it shows so little outlining. And finally, related to bokeh, is longitudinal chromatic aberration. At f0.95, the close-up image quality is too soft to really see it very clearly. 
At f1.4, we begin to see some contrast, and green and purple highlighting emerges, which is a bit more visible at f2, although at f2.8, that colour fringing is essentially gone. Well, that was interesting. What can we say overall? Some of you will have watched that review and thought, gosh, those were some real image quality problems, and yet others will have watched it while rubbing their hands in glee. This lens is designed for one thing, getting record-breakingly out of focus backgrounds while maintaining smooth bokeh and decent centre sharpness, while not completely breaking the bank. And that's a pretty good concoction for a lens for subject, portrait or art photography, so in that respect, the Minticon 50mm f0.95 for digital SLRs actually delivers, and considering its price of only $800, it'll probably find itself a little spot on the marketplace. If you're after perfect optics and corner sharpness, then this is definitely not the lens for you. But if you want a lens whose images can blow you away for a reasonable price, then it could well be what you need, and I really enjoyed using it.